My, my talk is not a general overview. What it is is a focus on the pathogenesis, how the disease works, and the longer-term outcomes for women. Now, uh, the definition, and uh, you can find them all over the place. This is very, very simplified. Is a high blood pressure in pregnancy with proteinuria or organ dysfunction. And the onset has to be after 20 weeks of the pregnancy for it to be called preeclampsia. Its target is the endothelium in the woman, delivery of the site of disease, which is really the placenta. That's where it starts. Uh, there's many grades. The real point about uh, the grades of preeclampsia is that they, they vary about uh, how, how urgent delivery should be. So severe preeclamplics need to be delivered at about 34 weeks. Those with HELP syndrome, which is a um, microangiopathy which affects the liver and the clotting system, really there's a big urgency. And with eclampsia, which are grand, grand mal convulsions, you want to deliver women within about 12 hours. So without delivery, you're going to sit with the disease and you have to control it. It's a huge public health problem, I think. In Soweto, our observational studies, community-based, suggest 7% of pregnancies affected. In South Africa, in the confidential inquiries from 2008 to 10, there were 679 maternal deaths from preeclampsia. I think the case fatality from extrapolating the numbers is about 1 in 300 for the disease and probably 1 in 20 for eclampsia in this country. So the disease is neither rare nor benign. It's a real problem and we spend many, many hours of our time every day at Krasani Barra trying to manage preeclampsia and eclampsia. The risk factors, there's a lot of them. First pregnancy is well known. New partner is well known. The pre-existing conditions, you'll notice hypertension, hyperlipidemia, diabetes, that really looks like metabolic syndrome and hypertension, and uh, keep those in mind. Current pregnancy as well, something wrong with the placenta, mole, multiple pregnancy, fetal anomaly, also risk. I don't know if you've heard of the two-stage model, but this helps us to understand preeclampsia. What happens is the placenta doesn't develop normally, and I'm going to show you that in a moment, and that leads later in the second half of pregnancy to the maternal syndrome of endothelial dysfunction with hypertension and protein in the urine and other problems. The big issue has always been what is the factor that causes this conversion of a placental disease into a maternal systemic illness. Well, if you have a look at this model, on the left is placenta, on the right is the uterus, and here is placenta growing into maternal tissue and that's the endometrium or decidua and there's the muscle. Now what happens is that the cytotrophoblast cells change their phenotype into endothelial cells and they line the spiral arteries. These are little microscopic arteries which come in from the uterus. They line these arteries with themselves and destroy the original intima and the original tunica media smooth muscle. So what happens is the spiral artery becomes a high capaci capacitance, um, low resistance vessel, which allows a huge amount of blood to be poured into this intervillous space to help the baby to grow and live. That's the normal. And there's the normal again. Here's the abnormal. This is what happens in preeclamptic placentas, and this has been shown many times on sections. This invasion of the spiral arteries by the cytotrophoblast is incomplete or very poor, and what happens is you don't have a nice big vessel you have a spiral artery which retains its muscle and its endothelial layer and it can constrict and blood doesn't flow well into the placenta from the mum. And that is the beginnings of preeclampsia. And what happens is the placenta stops functioning properly, the baby won't grow or may die. Now, uh, why does this happen? We really don't know. This is one of the holy grails of obstetrics. There's a whole lot of theories, hypoxia, immune and so on. There isn't time today to go into those. But it's fascinating what's been done around that. This uh, spasm in the spiral arteries shows in the first half of pregnancy in the uterine artery Doppler, which is an easy test that we can do in, in the rooms where we show a notch and a, a high resistance pattern with low end diastolic flow of the uterine artery. And that can help us to predict preeclampsia and some folks will give aspirin in low dose to any women who show that sort of pattern. 
to try and prevent preeclampsia, and it's partially successful. So what is this substance that comes from the placenta and goes into the circulation? We used to talk of toxemia of pregnancy. What is the toxin? I think the answer is almost there, and this is one of the great things from the last 10 years, and it has to do with angiogenic factors. I think you might have heard of endothelial, vascular endothelial growth factor and placental growth factor, which is one of that family of growth factors, transforming growth factor. These live in the circulation in, in us and in pregnant women, and they help blood vessels to grow, and they look after the endothelium and keep it healthy. What happens in preeclamptic placentas is things go a bit wrong, and two substances appear to be released. These are both receptors for these growth factors, but they get spliced off, and they then wander around into the maternal circulation. And what they do is they leach out these growth factors, which are supposed to be doing a job looking after the endothelium. And that's really bad news, because that causes the disease. There's fairly good evidence why this, that, that this happens. If you take uh, uh, SFLT1, serum FMS, soluble FMS like tyrosine kinase 1, it's such a damn mouthful. If you take S SFLT1 and endoglin and inject it into rodents, you will produce preeclampsia. And if you give vascular endothelial growth factor, you can rescue these rodents from the disease. And in humans, SFLT1 to PLGF, placental growth factor ratio, can be measured and it actually accurately predicts onset of preeclampsia soon. So that's pretty good evidence that this is what's going on. And what's, what is not very helpful about the ratio test is that there's nothing much you can do about it, but it does ex bring us exciting possibilities of treatment of preeclampsia with vascular endothelial growth factor or even statins. Statins are not supposed to be given in pregnancy, but in fact they have pleiotropic effects, effects other than lipid lowering, which may well make things better and ameliorate preeclampsia. And there's lots of research going to happen there. So in summary, things go wrong in the placenta for a whole lot of possible reasons. SFLT1 and endoglin are released into the circulation and cause the complications. And I think that's a fairly nice picture. And, and this two-stage theory has really been augmented a bit. So what happens when the woman is delivered? It's all very nice. Is everything over? Well, no. Things are not over. And there's quite a lot of stuff now from the last 10 or 15 years which tells us, as Naomi pointed out, that preeclampsia is associated with subsequent risks. And you can see chronic hypertension, ischemic heart, stroke, renal disease as well, microalbuminuria, metabolic syndrome. These all are increased significantly from a number, huge number of, of trials. There's meta-analysis and systematic review from Bellamy and a very nice paper from Valdivizio recently. Now you may say, weren't these the risk factors we said at the beginning? Is this, is this not simply the expression of the risk factor? Again, is preeclampsia not just an innocent passenger in uh, the woman's life of cardiovascular risk? So that uh, one is blaming it, whereas she had the risks in the beginning anyway. Well, the, the trials, the studies that are being done, they're not trials, suggest in fact after adjusting for underlying risk factors that no women with minimal cardiovascular risk have an increased risk after preeclampsia, and those with risks have an even higher risk after preeclampsia. So the passenger in the train is leaving all of a mess behind and increasing the risk for that woman. So really, uh, it, it is a problem in future life. And it's now been considered a stress test of the cardiovascular profile of women, pregnancy. And if women get preeclampsia and they cross this threshold of disease, having maybe been at risk when they were fetuses and, and little babies, they cross that threshold and they show cardiovascular disease with preeclampsia. And again, with the next pregnancy, they're likely to get their cardiovascular disease earlier. Here's a normal pregnancy. She might show evidence of cardiovascular disease, increased lipids and so on during the pregnancy, but doesn't show anything and only gets things later. This diagram from 2002 doesn't take into account the increasing risk. So I've pushed that one up. So there, there's a low risk. It's a higher risk after one preeclampsia. It's an even higher risk after another. So that really does suggest that we've got a window to the future when we find women with preeclampsia. 
In summary then, I think we've moved forward in the last decade in our understanding of the disease and particularly in the uh, angiogenic, anti-angiogenic war that we see in the circulation and the emerging knowledge on the long-term risks. And I think that we as clinicians should think more about it and when we consider women's cardiovascular risks, perhaps uh, consider pregnancy history. In fact, we must, as the guidelines suggest from Naomi. And I think we owe it to ourselves and our patients in this country to do research on this because unfortunately the studies that we saw, not a single one was from sub-Saharan Africa. And we don't really know the truth about what's going on in our country with preeclampsia and afterwards. Thank you very much.